Hi there and welcome back to Station Road. Today we're going to have a look at a different way of doing some grass. So you may be aware of static grass and flock or little granules of, of grass, um, either foam and so forth, or the also grass mat that you can buy and cut out. So traditionally, we would have uh, possibly static grass, and I do have some here, which is a uh, blend that I've uh, occasionally use. Uh, and of course, to um, use static grass, unfortunately, you need a static grass applicator. And interestingly enough, although the static grass is actually, uh, this is not overly expensive, it's reasonably uh, cheap. Uh, the problem is, is the applicators uh, are very expensive. And uh, you're talking possibly 80, 90 pounds maybe for, for, an, for an applicator. Uh, so uh, of course, in my static grass, I uh, converted a electric fly swat uh, with a uh, metal sieve on it and this actually works pretty well. It, it does the job. The fly swat was all of $10, maybe five pounds and a sieve which would have been a couple of dollars, maybe a pound. So for, you know, for under 10 pounds um, I made this and it, it, it does actually work quite well. Uh, so there's that. Now the other, another grass that I do use is uh, this um, well, this type of grass here, which of course is just a mat, and it's static grass that's already pre-applied, and this is quite good. Uh, it does, um, of course, um, conform to to shapes and hillsides reasonably well, um, and it certainly is a, a no mess way of doing things. What I do want to show you though is a method that I began using many years ago uh, simply because I couldn't get hold of this stuff or static grass simply because of what was available here in Christchurch. So uh, my alternative was to use dishcloths and uh, it actually worked out quite well. Uh, you'll probably see in a previous video uh, the hillside and that is essentially the entire hillside is dishcloths. So in this video um, I'll show you the process I use to achieve a reasonably good looking grass result. So what I thought I'd do is I'm going to ex add to the ballast example that I produced a couple of weeks back. So we will extend to this with some timber. So we've got some timber another piece of timber here which I will now add on to, to the back of this. We have some of the styrene so we'll actually get to use some of this um, dense polystyrene foam and I've pre-trimmed this all out so we've got a couple of stacks of that that we'll put in there and we'll shape this up and create ourselves a bit of a scene up behind here, some rolling hillside and I will actually use both of these dishcloths and we'll see what the difference is in terms of actual color once the uh, green paint is applied. So uh, without further ado, let's get on and uh, start building up this wee mini scene. Right, so the first thing I'm actually going to do is glue these bits of styrene to uh, the little baseboard section we've got here. So basically uh, doubling this up. So we're gonna have a nice sort of little, little low-lying hill or rise behind our display track. So we've got um, this dense polystyrene. Now I get this from a local hardware store here in Christchurch and it's very cheap and you get it in nice big sheets, I think 1200 by 600 and you can get them in this thickness here which I think is 25 mil and you can also get it in 50 mils which is double the thickness so it's actually twice that. Um, unfortunately I haven't got any of the 50 mil left so I'm just using some scrap bits of 25. Uh, this stuff is brilliant to carve and also uh, hot wire as well. Now unfortunately uh, I did have a hot wire which um, I used when I did um, the main components of my 
uh, layout and of course I didn't think I'd need it any longer so I sold it. Um, so uh, today I'm just going to be carving the um, basic sort of hillside shape with a craft knife and a nice sharp blade. So we'll get started with the gluing because that'll take a while. Now there's a couple of options here. Now the, of course we all know that the certain glues you can't use with polystyrene because uh, the glue melts it. Uh, now I would normally actually use something like this which is uh, called liquid nails and um, it is uh, it is polystyrene friendly. Uh, the only problem is it does take um, a reasonable amount of time for it to cure. It can take up to uh, 72 hours for this to cure. Now I don't have 72 hours on my side so um, I am going to use this stuff here which is a spray adhesive, multi-purse spray, spray adhesive. So we're going to use this. Um, I will actually just duck out of the way to another area to spray this because it will make a great big mess and I will uh, come back shortly. Right, so we've now glued the styrene sheets together onto the uh, base wood. Uh, it's, we'll just give it a few minutes for it to solidly dry out. I probably could, and I'm, I think I might actually do that, is just possibly, um, it's not moving. Um, I'm just wondering whether I maybe need to clamp it, but I won't do this actually because in most situations you'll be unable to actually clamp anything. The only thing you could do is actually put some weight on it. Um, so uh, maybe I might just do that. So uh, I'll be back in a second. I will just find something heavy uh, to put on top of this. Right, so I've gone and put a toolbox on top of my polystyrene. So in the meantime, while that is drying, uh, let's look at our dishcloth. Now I'll just try and get a close up. This is um, essentially this is what we're looking at. Now this is made by Chucks here in New Zealand. I'm not sure what might be available overseas in Britain or the States but I'm sure you probably find in the supermarket or a hardware store uh, a very similar kind of product. So we'll cut uh, the stitching off this and see how it goes. So um, this is what we have and as you'll see on the other side it is just simply a sort of fabric type backing uh, and uh, this works really well and of course being, being a fabric it forms over any sort of hell shape which is really good. So um, that's the yellow one, we'll cut open the orange one and see how that goes. I think this one might be a bit smaller. Right, so here we have the orange one. So that's what we end up with. We've got two quite quite different sizes. But um, essentially that will cover, so this area here we have got, it's basically 40 or 400 millimeters by 200, 260 millimeters for one pound 50. Now I'll just uh, pause the video at this point so I can have a bit of a clean up and we will see how the polystyrene stacks have dried. Right, so the drying's getting there. It's actually taking a little bit longer than, than expected, and even on this very hot day where it is now 32 degrees in the garage, we still have a little bit of slack in it, but, but otherwise, I think it's safe enough for me to start carving it. So uh, I'm just gonna draw out a quick uh, sort of profile for this.
so we now have this sort of carved into a basic sort of hill shape um, I wish I hadn't sold my uh, hot wire because actually cutting it with a craft knife is actually a lot more difficult uh, than I remember so uh, but essentially this is what we're going to sort of end up with um, is uh, a little bit lower here rising up here and then of course a embankment here what we'll do now is it, because as you can see um, you know it's a bit chunky and so forth not that it, it really matters too much because we're going to be gluing this stuff over the top but what I might do is just give it a bit of a quick sand um, just to smooth off any edges and of course this dense polystyrene like the really dense stuff uh, does actually uh, sand uh, quite well with just some normal sandpaper so we'll just do that now Right, so there we go, we've sort of given a bit of a quick sand and uh, that just smooths off any sort of uh, rough edges and so forth. Let's get this dishcloth glued down. Right, uh, so the glue that I use is a um, it's Gorilla wood glue and um, this is actually really good uh, PVA, it, this shouldn't take too long for it to dry. Right, so there we go. Uh, I will actually um, now leave this to uh, dry fully and then of course we can just trim off all the uh, excess around the edges and begin the painting process. Right, okay, so this is now pretty well and truly dried. So we will just go around now and just trim off the uh, excess. So that's pretty much trimmed off all the excess. So uh, now we have a nice um, psychedelic hillside. So uh, using the uh, green paints that I've got here, uh, we will begin the process of um, toning this up to uh, look more like a hillside. Right, so we'll begin the painting process now. Now uh, I have just uh, gone around again and just trimmed it with a pair of scissors just to tidy it up a bit and also given it a vacuum so any uh, loose stuff is now being uh, vacuumed off. So uh, some paints here what we've got I often I sort of have my favorite uh, green which is uh, quite a what appears to be well it might not show on the camera a very intense bright green um, but I often actually use this as my base point, uh, in which case then I then add um, some, there's a duller green there, so that's more of a muted green. And then we have some highlighting areas, so that's sort of more of a highlighted uh, green there. Now these are all just cheap uh, acrylic test pots from local we uh, local hardware store. Uh, acrylic paints and then we've got sort of a quite a deep muddy green there actually uh, which I think I might have that might actually be a mix that I've made myself so yeah so 
we'll begin the process we'll start with this green here now the trick is really I think to start with the um, using the uh, toothbrush uh, seems to be the best method is just to start off lightly with the green so I just sort of simply um, dip the toothbrush into the pottle and sort of brush off most of it and then basically I start by lightly going over it don't push the, the toothbrush down hard into the actual dishcloth like the idea is to sort of skim across because what happens if you put too much paint in there is it ends up just clumping the fibers together and it sort of ends up looking looking a bit matted um, so the idea is to sort of start with a with these sort of light strokes almost as if you're polishing your shoes and then you just sort of work it in and it doesn't you're not trying to get a um, consistent result because um, no two grass blades are the same and uh, so it sort of actually works out quite well in terms of um, you know, sort of just dot it around because we don't want to try and avoid too many sort of clumps of um, paint and then you just sort of flick it up and uh, that gets your grass sort of standing up on it, on its end again. Right, so there we have it. Um, so that is my dishcloth grass. So, you know, this is going to suit more of a rural, uh, unkept wilderness type scene. It's definitely not something that you're going to have in a well manicured backyard. So, uh, we'll finish off a few bits. I'm actually going to uh, do this sort of embankment here, and uh, then we can actually put this in with that and we have ourselves a backdrop so we're just going to finish off by doing a, uh, a base brown color on this uh, cutting and uh, then we will sort of apply some freshly gathered dirt from the garden uh, to this cutting So the base brown's pretty much dry now, so we'll apply this garden soil and see how that goes. Right, so here we have it. Uh, I've finished all, well, pretty much finished it off. I probably will put some fences in, or some fencing somewhere, and 
maybe even uh, a random uh, <coughs> cow or sheep or something like that. But um, essentially, if we will just take that away, that's the previous uh, video. But um, yeah, if you can uh, see that, I'll just swivel that light around. So um, there we have it. So with the grass, I've put a bit of um, bit of extra stuff on here. Some old scrappy trees that I had lurking in a drawer, which I didn't really want to use on the layout. So I've just popped them in there as well to sort of that mark that as the division uh, between the two different grasses. I will say though, I probably I do I prefer the yellow uh, dishcloths. Uh, the orange dish, dish cloth do, does come out with a bit of a, a more of an oddball colour, um, whereas the um, the yellow tends to give a, a more of a realistic sort of uh, wild grass look. So there we have it. I think it's come out well. So we've, uh, we've got the soil there that's um, you know for a pretty sort of basic, simple looking bank, but um, you know it does does the job. I could have actually um, carved or scratch scratch some sort of grooves in it to make it look like it's been dug out or something like that but um, and of course I could always sort of embed some rocky um, components into it but this is more about the grass and um, and how, how it comes out and to me you know I think it's a it's a good alternative so I thought we'll uh, just try a setting a scene so I've got uh, my uh, B2 Hornby um, Peckett locomotive on our display track for today and if we zoom right in I particularly like this locomotive of course because um, it's got uh, quite an incredible amount of detail for such a small locomotive but uh, yeah if we uh, zoom in there we've got uh, you know it looks the part So there we have it, how to turn a dishcloth into some model grass. Uh, I certainly hope you enjoyed today's video and gained some inspiration and also maybe you all might rush out now and go and buy some dishcloths and acrylic paint. So thank you all for watching and please do uh, like and subscribe and also I'd love to hear your comments on this particular how-to video and I'll look forward to seeing you next time. Thank you. Bye.